I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library. Thank you for joining me. Today I'm going to be reading selections from Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. When I picture Benjamin Franklin, uh, I see him as an older man in the 1770s and 1780s, when he was a member of the Continental Congress, signer of the Declaration of Independence, and ambassador to France. But when he began publishing the Almanac in 1732, he was just 26 years old. He had learned the printing trade from his brother James as a young teenager and began writing short satirical pieces for his brother's newspaper. Born in Boston, Franklin moved to Philadelphia when he was 17, then to London for a time, and then back to Philadelphia, all before the age of 21. In Philadelphia, he established the Junto. Franklin wrote of the group that it was a like-minded group of aspiring artisans and tradesmen who hoped to improve themselves while they improved their communities. To provide the Junto with books and other reading material, he established the first subscription library in America, the Library Company of Philadelphia, in which subscribers contributed money to purchase books and then share them. This was all before Poor Richard's Almanac. Franklin was a very energetic young man. Poor Richard's Almanac was his first financial success. Almanacs were popular at the time in part because of their predictions of weather and other happenings for the upcoming year, often based on astrology. Franklin satirized this in the first few edition of Poor Richard's by predicting the death of rival almanac publisher Titan Leeds, whose American almanac was well established and successful. The feud between the two lasted until Leeds' death in 1739. So I'm going to read the exchange between Franklin as poor Richard and Leeds in their respective almanacs in the 1730s. I'll start with the first edition of poor Richard's almanac for the year 1733 that was published in 1732. Preface to poor Richard. 1733. Courteous reader, I might in this place attempt to gain thy favor by declaring that I write almanacs with no other view than that of the public good. But in this I should not be sincere, and men nowadays are too wise to be deceived by pretenses how specious soever. The plain truth of the matter is, I am excessive poor, and my wife, good woman, is, I tell her, excessive proud. She cannot bear, she says, to sit spinning in her shift of toe while I do nothing but gaze at the stars, and has threatened more than once to burn all my books and rattling traps, as she calls my instruments, if I do not make some profitable use of them for the good of my family. The printer has offered me some considerable share of the profits, and I have thus begun to comply with my dame's desire. Indeed, this motive would have had force enough to have made me publish an almanac many years since, had it not been overpowered by my regard for my good friend and fellow student, Mr. Titan Leeds, whose interest I was extremely unwilling to hurt. But this obstacle, I am far from speaking it with pleasure, is soon to be removed, since inexorable death, who has, was never known to respect merit, has already prepared the mortal dart. The fatal sister has already extended her destroying shears and that ingenious man must soon be taken from us. He dies by my calculation made at his request on October 17, 1733, third hour, 29th minute, post-meridian, at the very instant of the conjunction of the Sun and Mercury. By his own calculation, he will survive until the 26th of the same month. This small difference between us we have disputed whenever we have met these nine years past but at length he is inclinable to agree with my just judgment. Which of us is most exact a little time will now determine. As therefore these provinces may not longer expect to see any of his performances after this year, I think myself free to take up the task and request a share of the public encouragement, which I am more apt to hope for on this account that the buyer of my almanac may consider himself not only as purchasing a useful utensil, but is performing an act of charity to his poor friend and servant, R. Saunders. 
So Titan Leeds responded in his American Almanac of 1734 uh, to poor Richard's prediction. Kind reader, perhaps it may be expected that I should say something concerning an almanac printed for the year 1733, said to be writ by poor Richard or Richard Saunders, who for want of other matter was pleased to tell his readers that he had calculated my nativity and from thence predicts my death to be the 17th of October, 1733, at 22 minutes past 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and that these provinces may not expect to see any more of his, Titan Leeds, performances, and this precise predictor, who predicts to a minute, proposes to succeed me in writing of almanacs, but notwithstanding his false prediction, I have, by the mercy of God, lived to write a diary for the year 1734, and to publish the folly and ignorance of this presumptuous author. Nay, he adds another gross falsehood in his said almanac, viz. by my own calculation I shall survive until the 26th of the said month, October, which is as untrue as the former, for I do not pretend to that knowledge, although he has usurped the knowledge of the Almighty herein, and manifested himself a fool and a liar. And by the mercy of God I have lived to survive this conceited scribbler's day and minute whereon he has predicted my death. And as I, I, and as I have supplied my country with almanacs for thirty-seven years by past, to the general satisfaction, so perhaps I live to write when his performances are dead. Thus much from your annual friend, Titan Leeds, October 18th, 1733, third hour, thirty-three minutes, Post Meridian. Poor Richard responds in his almanac for the year 1734. Courteous readers, your kind and charitable assistance last year in purchasing so large an impression of my almanacs has made my circumstances much more easy in the world and requires my grateful acknowledgement. My wife has been enabled to get a pot of her own and is no longer obliged to borrow one from a neighbor nor have we ever since been without something of our own to put in it. She has also got a pair of shoes, two new ships, and a new warm petticoat. And for my part, I have bought a second-hand coat so good that I am now not ashamed to go to town or be seen there. These things have rendered her temper so much more pacific than it used to be that I may say that I have slept more and more quietly within this last year than in the three foregoing years put together. Accept my hearty thanks, therefore, and my sincere wishes for your health and prosperity. In the preface to my last almanac, I foretold the death of my dear friend and fellow student, the learned and ingenious Mr. Titan Leeds, which was to be on the 17th of October, 1733, third hour, 29th minute, post-meridian, at the very instant of the conjunction of the moon and mercury. By his own calculation, he was to survive until the 26th of the same month and expire in the time of the eclipse, near 11 o'clock a.m. At which of these times he died, or whether he be really yet day, dead, I cannot at this present writing positively assure my readers, for as much as a disorder of my own family demanded my presence, and would not permit me, as I had intended, to be with him in his last moments, to receive his last embrace, to close his eyes and do the duty of a friend in performing the last offices to the departed. Therefore it is that I cannot positively affirm whether he be dead or not, for the stars only show to the skillful what will happen in the natural and universal chain of causes and effects. But tis well known that the events which would otherwise certainly happen at certain times in the course of nature are sometimes set aside or postponed for wise and good reasons by the immediate particular dispositions of providence, which particular dispositions the stars can by no means discover or foreshow. There is, however, and I cannot speak of it without sorrow, there's the strongest probability that my dear friend is no more, for there appears in his name, as I am assured, an almanac for the year 1734, in which I am treated in a very gross and unhandsome manner, in which I am called a false predictor an ignorant, a conceited scribbler, a fool, and a liar. Mr. Leeds was too well-bred to use any man so indecently and so scarlessly, 
and moreover his esteem and affection for me was extraordinary. So that it is to be feared that pamphlet may only be a contrivance or somebody or other who hopes perhaps to sell a two or three years almanac still by the sole force and virtue of Mr. Lee's name, but certainly to put words into the mouth of a gentleman and a man of letters against his friend, in which the meanest and most scandalous of the people might be ashamed to utter even in a drunken quarrel, is an unpardonable, unpardonable injury to his memory and an imposition upon the public. Mr. Leeds was not only profoundly skillful in the useful science he professed, but he was a man of exemplary sobriety, a most sincere friend, and an exact performer of his word. These valuable qualifications, with many others so much endeared him to me, that although it should be so, that contrary to all probability, contrary to my prediction and his own, he might possibly be yet alive, Yet my loss of honor as a prognosticator cannot afford me so much mortification as his life, health, and safety would give me joy and satisfaction. I am, courteous and kind reader, your poor friend and servant, R. Saunders, October 30th, 1733. And the next preface to Poor Richard's Almanac for the year 1735. Courteous reader. This is the third time of my appearing in print, hitherto very much to my own satisfaction, and, I have reason to hope, to the satisfaction of the public also. For the public is generous, and has been very charitable and good to me. I should be ungrateful then if I did not take every opportunity of expressing my gratitude. I therefore return the public my most humble and hearty thanks. Whatever may be the music of the spheres, how great soever the harmony of the stars, Tis certain there is no harmony among the stargazers, but they are perpetually growling and snarling at one another like strange curs, or like some men at their wives. I had resolved to keep my peace on my own part and affront none of them, and I shall persist in that resolution. But having received much abuse from Titan Leeds deceased, Titan Leeds when living would not have used me so, I say, having received much abuse from the ghost of Titan Leeds, who pretends to be still living, and to write almanacs in spite of me and my predictions, I cannot help saying that though I take it patiently, I take it very unkindly. And whatever he may pretend, tis undoubtedly true that he is really defunct and dead. First, because the stars are seldom disappointed, never but in the case of wise men, and they foreshadowed his death at the time I predicted it. Secondly, was requisite and necessary, he should die punctually at that time, for the honor of astrology, the art professed both by him and his father before him. Thirdly, tis plain to every one that reads his last two almanacs, for 1734 and 35, that they are not written with that life his performances used to be written with. The wit is low and flat, the little hints dull and spiritless, nothing smart in them, but Huldebras's verses against astrology at the heads of the months in the last, which no astrologer but a dead one would have inserted, and no man living would or could write such stuff as the rest. But lastly, I convince him in his own words that he is dead, for in his preface to his almanac for 1734, he says, Saunders adds another gross falsehood in his almanac, viz. that by my own calculation I shall survive until the 26th of said month, October 1733, which is as untrue as the former. Now if it be, as Leed says, untrue and a gross falsehood that he survived until the 26th of October 1733, then it is certainly true that he died before that time. And if he died before that time, he is dead now to all intents and purposes anything he may say to the contrary notwithstanding. And at what time before the 26th is it so likely he should die, as at that time by me predicted, viz. the 17th of October aforesaid. But if some people will walk and be troublesome after death, and may perhaps be born with a little, because it cannot well be avoided unless one would be at the pains and expense of laying them in the Red Sea, However, they should not presume too much upon the liberty allowed them. I know confinement must needs be mighty irksome to a free spirit of an astronomer, and I am too compassionate to proceed suddenly to extremities with it, 
Nevertheless, though I resolve with reluctance, I shall not long defer if it does not speedily learn to treat its living friends with better manners. I am, courteous reader, your obliged friend and servant, R. Saunders. This last is the uh, uh, beginning of Poor Richard's Almanac for 1740. Uh, by this time, um, Titan Leaves has died. He dies in 1739. Uh, so uh, the introduction to Poor Richard's Almanac for 1740. Courteous readers, you may remember that in my first almanac, published in, for the year 1733, I predicted the death of my dear friend Titan Leaves, Philomath, to happen that year on the 17th day of October, third hour, 29th meridian, post-meridian. The good man, it seems, died accordingly. But W.B. and A.B. have continued to publish almanacs in his name ever since, asserting for some years that he was still living. At length, when the truth could no longer be concealed from the world, they confess his death in their almanac for 1739, but pretend that he died not till last year, and that before his departure he had furnished them with calculations for seven years to come. Ah, uh, my friends, these are poor shifts and thin disguises of which indeed I should have taken little or no notice, if you had not at the same time accused me as a false predictor, an aspersion that the more affects me as my whole livelihood depends on a contrary character. But to put this matter beyond dispute, I shall acquaint the world with a fact, as strange and surprising as it is true, being as follows. On the fourth instant, toward midnight, as I sat in my little study writing this preface, I fell fast asleep, and continued in that condition for some time, without dreaming anything, to my knowledge. On awakening, I found lying before me the following letter. Dear friend Saunders, my respect for you continues even in this separate state, and I am grieved to see the aspersions thrown on you by the malevolence of avaricious publishers of almanacs, who envy your success. They say your prediction of my death in 1733 was false and they pretend that I remained alive many years after. But I do hereby certify that I did actually die at that time, precisely at the hour you mentioned, with a variation of only 5 minutes 53 seconds, which must be allowed to be of no great matter in such cases. And I do farther declare that I furnished them with no calculation of the planet's motions, etc., seven years after my death, as they are pleased to give out, so that the stuff they publish is an almanac in my name, tis no more mine than tis yours. You will wonder, perhaps, how this paper comes written on your table. You must know that no separate spirits are under any confinement until after the final settlement of all accounts. In the meantime, we wander where we please, visit our old friends, observe their actions, enter sometimes into their imaginations, and give them hints, waking or sleeping, that may be of advantage to them. Finding you asleep, I entered your left nostril, ascended into your brain, found out where the ends of those nerves were fastened that move your right hand and fingers, by the help of which I am now writing unknown to you, but when you open your eyes, you will see that the hand written is mine, though wrote with yours. The people of this infidel age, perhaps, will hardly believe this story, but you may give them these three signs by which they shall be convinced of the truth of it. About the middle of June next, J. J. Philomat shall be openly reconciled to the Church of Rome and give all his goods and chattels to the chapel, being perverted by a certain country schoolmaster. On the 7th of September following, my old friend W. B. shall be sober nine hours, to the astonishment of all his neighbors. And about the same time, W. B. and A. B. will publish another almanac in my name, in spite of truth and common sense. As I can see much clearer into futurity since I got free from the dark prison of flesh in which I was continually molested and almost blinded with fogs arising from tiff and the smoke of burnt drams, I shall, in kindness to you, frequently give you informations of things to come for the improvement of your almanac, being dear, your affectionate friend, T. Leaves. For my own part, I am convinced that the above letter is genuine. If the reader doubts of it, let him carefully observe the three signs, and if they do not actually come to pass, 
believe as he pleases. I am his humble friend, R. Saunders, October 7th, 1739. So thank you very much for listening and have a good week.